I will tell you, this is a great day. It's a beautiful day. And it is the day that the Lord has made. And we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. So, listen, I've got something for you today that I really have been looking forward to sharing. And we're going to look first. Uh, we're going to be praying for people. Thank you for your prayer requests that are coming in. Uh, I hate that you have prayer requests. I would rather you be, uh, as the scripture says, you know, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. But if you're in a current situation where you need healing and help, that's what we're here for. So we're going to help you today. We're going to get to the prayer request in just a minute. But I do want to share this with you because this is vitally important. And remember, these broadcasts uh, being done right now in the middle of all the COVID-19 coronavirus thing, um, obviously, uh, you know, a lot of our broadcasts are about healing anyway. But we are talking specifically in these broadcasts about helping defeat this thing. And so uh, wh what I'm actually do is, uh, doing is I'm giving you daily uh, teaching and training in what to begin doing so that you can take your part in helping to overthrow this attack of the enemy. Now, so first, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> and if you look at verse, well, we could start actually in verse Two at the very end. I just want to pick up on the very end of this where he says, some people think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Then in verse three, he says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Then he says in verse four, and this is the apostle Paul, of course, for the weapons of our warfare, the weapons of our warfare. See, we have a warfare. God does not fight for us. See, in the Old Testament, God fought for the people. In the New Testament, God fights through his people. Remember that. That's vital. Many people just sit back and think, well, God's going to fight my battle. No, he's not. He gave you weapons. He told you uh, to fight the good fight of faith. And so there is a part you must do if you're going to overcome and be victorious in faith. Now, <clears throat> verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So what does that tell us? Well, uh, you know, thank God we've got doctors and medicine and that kind of stuff out there. And th their weapons are carnal. Their weapons are earthly. Their weapons are flesh oriented. And thank God for them and God bless them. But that's not us. All right. That's not my job. My job is to take my weapons of my warfare, which are not carnal. And instead, instead of being carnal, my weapons are mighty through God to the, now watch, to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, I understand, and, and you'll understand here in just a second if you don't already know this. When he talks about this warfare, this warfare he's talking about predominantly is in the area of the mind. It's in the area of the enemy attacking your mind and trying to get you out of faith and into fear. And so here he says that our our the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, these strongholds are not principalities and powers. They are uh, wrong teaching, wrong ideas, wrong beliefs, sacred cows. That's the strongholds that are in people's minds. Then he says, casting, in verse 5, casting down imaginations. Now, this is the real thing, the casting down imaginations, because the word imaginations here literally means reasonings. Computation is the way one translation says it. But it has to do with reasoning, thinking things through and taking the evidence that you have from the natural and coming up with some type of uh, solution or conclusion. And he said, but our weapons are mighty through God, the pulling down of strongholds, and that means casting down reasonings and natural ideas about things and every and casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So now this book, <clears throat> this book called the Bible is the knowledge of God. And so <clears throat> here he says that we're going to cast down these imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now the knowledge of God says by his stripes, we are healed. And by his stripes, we were healed. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, <clears throat> our weapons 
or for the pulling down of these strongholds, these imaginations, these reasonings, okay? And these things are things that exalt themselves against the knowledge that by his stripes were healed. Now, look at this because he says here, and here's the key, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, we're going to stop right there in this path. We could go on. There's a lot more. <clears throat> but notice it says that the key here is we're going to cast down imaginations. We're going to pull down strongholds. We're going to cast down everything that rises up against the knowledge of God. Con it means that it, is in, that it is contrary to the word of God. And that's what we're going to do. Is we're going to, that's, that's what our job is, is to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, which means the enemy is going to try to bombard your mind usually with thoughts of fear, doubt, unbelief, things are going to try to get you going a certain way. But our job is as soon as we recognize those things attacking us, we are to pull those down, take them into uh, captivity and go, no, I do not agree with that. that. That is contrary to the word of God. So in the name of Jesus right now, I refuse to think that. Instead, I'm going to think this. Instead of thinking, well, I, I'm probably going to catch the virus. No, we're going to think, no, by his stripes, I was healed. By his stripes, if I was, I is, all right? Not good English, but it's good theology. And so you have to train your mind to think according to the word of God. Now, also, I will tell you, God does not want you to spend all your time casting down imaginations. He wants you, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16, he says that we have the mind of Christ. So he wants us to think with the mind of Christ. He wants us to think the way Jesus thought. Now, how do you think Jesus thought about sickness or disease? Well, he knew it was defeatable, right? He knew that he could defeat it. He, number two, he had no fear of it. And whenever he knew people and saw people that had contagious diseases, he did not hesitate even then to lay hands on them, to speak to them, to command them to be healed. All of this, this was his mind. This is how he thought, and this is the mind that is supposed to be in us. And the Bible even tells us, let the same mind that was in Christ be in us. Now, someone would say, well, in that context, it says, let this mind that was in Christ be in you, that you would serve and that you would submit, submit to one another and that you would serve in love. Well, that's what I'm talking about. You cannot have fear of sickness or disease and have a mind have the mind of Christ that is submitted to God and is willing to minister to people, lay hands on people, and set them free. It won't work together. Now, I want to move on with this because I want to share these things with you. So notice, <clears throat> we do have weapons. We have weapons for a warfare. We're in a warfare. And these weapons uh, here, uh, it doesn't tell us what these weapons are in the sense of saying, here's your weapons. But now notice, it says that our weapons do this. Our weapons pull down strongholds. Our weapons are mighty through God. They're not carnal. They're not earthly. They're not normal. Do you get that? Our weapons are not the same weapons that the unsaved have. Our weapons are godly weapons, strong weapons, strong through God. And the result of our weapons is that they will pull down strongholds. They will cast down imaginations. And it is amazing, if, even right now in the midst of all of this, if you see the imaginations, the reasonings, the conclusions that people are coming to, it is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. I'm telling you, you know, the Bible is very clear that the uh, wicked flee when none pursue, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And actually what you're seeing is you're seeing a whole bunch of people fleeing instead of the righteous being bold. And that right there is a determining factor. And you can look at it and say, am I fleeing in my mind? Am I fleeing from things? Am I afraid of things? Am I withdrawing? Or am I bold? Am I speaking the truth? Am I living the truth? Am I doing the truth? Now, <clears throat> go with me over to, we're going to go to Ephesians. And this, you already know this, of course. But in Ephesians, it actually talks about our weapons and tells us what they are. So Ephesians chapter 6. Now, here's, here's something. I just actually heard this come up in the spirit that somebody, and I know this may sound strange, but somebody was thinking just now, well, that's just scripture. You know, I've heard these scriptures before. Well, and that's your problem. 
you think you've heard it before. You're thinking because you've heard it before, well, it doesn't really matter. No, you can hear it every day and you need to get it every day. You need to realize these are not just scriptures. This is the word of God. This is God's word written down so that we can speak it. You know, I love what um, I heard Mark Hankins say one time that God's word was first spoken so it could be written and it was written so it could be spoken. That's just good. That's just good. And so we have this word written down that we can read it, get it into us, act on it. But first, and I would even say maybe even primarily in many cases, so that we can speak it. We need to be speaking God's word. Now, Ephesians <clears throat> chapter 6, verse 10, the Apostle Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So we're, see, the, the problem, a lot of people, uh, it, it, right now, if people are in fear, it's because they are looking at this situation through their strength or their own uh, natural idea of the fact that they can naturally resist this thing or not resist it. But beloved, when you are strong in the power of the Lord, when you're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, you're no longer looking at this for now. And we're just using this as the example because it's current situation. You're no longer looking at this coronavirus microbe uh, from the eyes of, oh, it can get me. Now you're looking at it through the eyes of the Lord and you're looking at it through the mind of Christ and you're saying, you know what? If that thing gets near me, it will die because it has no right to live in this body. Your body is not your own. Your body was bought with a price. It was bought with the blood of Jesus. The Bible tells us to present our bodies a living sacrifice. It tells us that he wants to keep us and to uh, protect us, as we would even say, but to keep us or sanctify us, to separate us unto himself, spirit, soul, and body. Beloved, your body is to be holy. Your body is to be uh, perfect in every way. It is to function correctly in every way. <clears throat> and that does not mean sickness. So now he says here, <clears throat> this is just the first verse. So we're going to have to read through this. But he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So let your strength be in his might. In other words, lean not to your own strength. Don't lean to the flesh. Don't lean and, and, and just say, well, can I resist this? Is my immune system strong? And, and can I resist it? Well, you know, I'm not 70. I'm not so, I, I'm out of, the, I'm out of the, the, the woods here, so to speak. I don't have to worry about it. No, this thing has been hitting a lot of other people too, apparently. And so, of all ages, I should say. <clears throat> so what we're saying here is this. When you start looking at that and saying, well, you know, it's really only hitting older people. It's really only hitting people with underlying physical conditions uh, already. So, no, what you're doing is you're comparing physical with physical. And you're looking and now you're trying to say, so my physical strength should be able to keep me. No, that means you're relying on your own strength. That means you're relying on your own ability to resist this thing. And he doesn't say that here. He says for you to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Lean on his might, not to your own strength, right? Now, in the verse 11, he tells us how to do this. He says, put on the whole armor of God so that you might or may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, the wiles of the devil here is the uh, devices, the plans, the, the strategies, uh, the tactics of the devil, okay? Uh, actually, I think the Greek word here is uh, methodia, which is where we get our word, the methods of the devil. <clears throat> he says, if you, now notice, if you put on the whole armor of God, you will be able to stand against the methods of the devil. Well, let me tell you something. Virus, diseases, things like that, those are the methods of the devil. They are not the methods of God, right? They are the methods of the devil. And here it says, if you put on the whole armor of God, you will be able to stand against the methods of the devil. Of the devil. So let's see what these, what this whole armor of God is. Because we have it on, then the methods of the devil can't get to us. So here it is. I'm, I'm going I'm to show you how to be, how to become, and how to live immune from sickness and disease, and honestly every other uh, attack and method of the devil. So look at verse uh, 12. Now he says, "For we wrestle not against flesh and blood; we wrestle." not against flesh and blood. And that is also referring to the natural things. Because remember at the beginning, <clears throat> um, what we read in, in uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, he said, 
that our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God. And here he says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So here he says, so this whole armor of God will allow us uh, to stand against the methods of the devil. And, but we have to recognize that we're not fighting against the carnal things. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're not uh, fighting against the carnal things of this world. Now watch. But instead, against principalities, against powers. Now these are spirits, okay? Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. So now he's saying that, that our fight is in the spirit realm. Our fight is not against anybody, okay? Any, any physical people here on earth. Might not agree with them. Might not believe what they believe, uh, all that. But we're not fighting against them. And if, honestly, if you spend your time fighting against them, then the devil's already beat you because he has, a, he has pulled you out of the spirit realm and into the natural, and now you're fighting. Now, we see this all the time between uh, Democrats and Republicans fighting back and forth. You know, they're, they're fiddling while Rome is burning, all right? And they're not taking this thing seriously uh, in the sense of trying to help people. And at some point, people need to realize uh, these people that are playing games and are not serious about it, they're just fighting over getting their things that they've been wanting to get. No, it's time you get past that. <clears throat> Quit adding all the, you know, as I used to call it, pork barrel or whatever it is, uh, to these things, all the pork to these uh, laws. Strip it all away and do only what is necessary right now and get it done. Because the average everyday people are the ones that are hurting. So, again, so I'm trying not to get political on this. But honestly, uh, we've got to recognize where we're fighting. And that's what I'm saying. We're not fighting against politicians. We are fighting against spirits who are, who are whispering into politicians' ears. And this is where we need to place our fight. And we need to be fighting against principalities and powers and the uh, rulers of the darkness of the world against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Now watch what he says again in verse 13. He repeats what he says in verse 11. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Notice the whole armor. Just having a couple of pieces leaves you vulnerable. Wherever you don't, whatever piece of armor you don't have on, you are vulnerable. So you need to have the whole armor so you are completely protected. Now, he says, so that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Well, you know what? This is the evil day. This is uh, that time. And so the Bible says to redeem the time because the day is evil. Well, like I said, this is the evil day. This is the day when bad things are happening. And it says here that if you have take on the whole armor of God, you'll be able to stand. So when the dust settles, we want you standing. And he says, and having done all to stand. So that you can stand and having done all to stand. Then in verse 14, he says, stand therefore. And now he starts describing the armor. And he says, having your loins girt about with truth. So that's the first thing. You have to have truth. Well, what is truth? Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Sanctify them with your word, with your truth. So the first thing is, you have, it says, have your loins girt about, right? I mean, that means what they had to do was they had to be, tighten all of the armor held together uh, where, the, where the loins and everything came together. And so this, everything, all the rest of these uh, armor has to be equipped through truth. Now, you have to remember, when we say truth, what, what does that mean? <clears throat> well, the Bible even tells us we should worp, worship God in spirit and in truth. So it is according to his word that we do these things, and we have to have our loins girt about, strengthened, tightened together with truth. That means no sacred cows. That means no traditions of men. That means going into the word of God, seeing what it says. You know, just last night, uh, I'm not going to deviate here, for, but just for a second, I guess. Uh, just before I went to sleep last night, I was lying there and just thinking about some things. And, you know, I, I'm just so grieved in my spirit when I started thinking about all the different teachings that are out there, all, all the different camps, you know, all the different quote unquote gospels. I mean, everybody has a piece, uh, you know, of maybe a piece of the truth. But then they have so much other tradition, so much other garbage. And, and the biggest one that I know of, honestly, this is probably the biggest thing that defeats most people, is the fact that they have a, an old covenant mindset, even though they're supposed to be functioning in the new covenant. And I've said before, this would be like someone having a, 
uh, you know, I'm not gonna say a Mac or something because of the differences, but let's say with a PC, uh, you, you've got a PC and you've got, you know, uh, Windows, now I don't know what it is, Windows 10, 12, 15, I don't know, it's, it's up there, <laughs> so, but you, you have the modern version now, but imagine if you find somebody that had a PC that still had Windows 3.1 or, you know, something like that on it, you, you would laugh at them almost because you would say, and they'd say, well, I don't understand what's wrong with my computer. Uh, it, it, I can't get it to open these applications. I can't get it to open this file. I can't get it to do these things. Why? Because you're still trying to function. All these things are new, these new applications and things, and you're still trying to function or access them through <clears throat> an old operating system that doesn't do it anymore. Well, that's the problem that we have in the church today. We have most of the people, most, and I'm saying that bluntly, we have most of the people in the church today are still, <clears throat> they're in the new covenant. They're, they're probably even born again. But the problem is they're in a new covenant, they're new creations, but they're still trying to access their inheritance, all their inheritance of this new, of, of the New Testament. And that we've got all these great inheritances, these great benefits of being in the new covenant. And yet they're still trying to access it through an old covenant mindset. And they're still trying to, you know, pray down the power and call down the fire. And they're still trying. And it's so sad because it doesn't work. Now, it, it may eventually produce something, <clears throat> but it's so long and drawn out that it's basically useless. And to be honest with you, most of the time it won't even work. And then people come with these ideas about, oh, this is God. He's trying to teach us something. God's trying to show us something. No, no, he's not. Uh, believe me, the Holy Spirit is trying to get you as a new creation to function as a new creation. You know, this has been what we've been emphasizing for the last you know, 20 years is that you have to be this new creation functioning as a new creation, functioning like Jesus. And so, but that is the biggest problem. That is by far the biggest problem. And if you function that way, then you don't have your loins girt with truth and you're going to be defeated. You're not going to be able to stand. So this, you know, if the, the, the foundation here has to be that you're going to get in the Word of God and get the Word of God in you. And, but it has to be rightly divided. It has to be done in context. You can't just pull out this verse, pull out that verse, and make it say whatever you want it to say. So, now notice here, he goes on in uh, <clears throat> verse 14. He says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now notice, your breastplate is righteousness. So you have to know the truth and you have to know the truth about your righteousness. And God said, their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord God. And so we have to understand that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Because of Christ, we are the righteousness of God. See, at one time, we weren't just sinners. We were sin. Sin had totally, completely uh, saturated us. Our spirits were sin. They were dead in trespasses and sin. And we were sin. But then when you get born again, your, your spirit gets recreated. And your spirit, once it gets recreated, it is recreated after the image and likeness of the one that recreated you, which is God himself. And now you are the righteousness of God. And now you're able to stand up in the name of Jesus and speak with force, speak and give a command. And these things, the, the, the natural order of things will bend and bow to your command because you are speaking through righteousness in Christ. You're not doing it. You're not speaking the same, uh, you know, body, don't you get sick uh, because I live good. Body, don't get sit, sick because I pay my tithes. No, that's when you're trying to go back to your own righteousness, which will always be as filthy rags if you're trying to go based on what you have built. But once you move into Christ and once you move into the righteousness, which is by faith in Christ, now you start to speak in, in, uh, we would even say nowadays instead or in the place of Jesus. And when you speak, it's as if he is speaking. And what you say, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you, uh, you know, as we would say, what we, what we would forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And what we permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. People say, well, why did God let this happen? God didn't let it happen. You let it happen. He's waiting for you to forbid it. And when you forbid it, it, he agrees and goes, yes, I agree with my children. And they said this and I agree. So it is forbidden in Jesus name. 
And so it's time. Now watch, I'm going to show you how important this is. And this is the key. You need to start forbidding this, not just this coronavirus, but everything. Cancer. Uh, you know, every time of every type of sickness and disease and lack and every every area, you need to start forbidding that to come near your dwelling, to even come near your house. You need to start forbidding it to come to your body, to your children's body, to your spouse's body, all these areas. You need to start forbidding this, anything from coming in. Now, I'll show you this. Let's go further. He says, so we've already talked about having your loins girt about with truth, having the, on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What does that mean? That means because now you have on the sandals, the shoes of the gospel of peace. What does that mean? That God is at peace with man. Amen? And so, you know, it said, this is one of the uh, uh, proclamations that was made whenever Jesus was born. Peace on earth, good will toward men. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that there was going to be no more wars? Well, of course not. Look around. All he was saying was, look, God is saying there should be peace on earth now. Be, why? Because there should be, now there is goodwill between God and man. Because Jesus was being born and Jesus is going to remove all of the wrong. He's going to remove all these things and he's going to take our punishment for us. And so that God will now be able to deal with man the way he desires. And the way he desires is to walk with man like he did in the garden to walk with men, to talk with men, to fellowship with men. And, you know, if you're sick and diseased and all these things, I will just say it bluntly. You can't fellowship with God the same way you could if you were physically well, mentally well, spiritually well. You can't do it because you're hurting. Your mind is drawn off to the pain. Your mind is drawn off to, what am I going to live? Am I going to die? And there's this fear and all that kind of stuff. And the Bible is clear. That when you walk with God and you know his love, then you're, 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 you're perfected in that love. You're matured in that love and you know his love for you. And being matured in the love of God, perfected in the love of God, drives out sickness. and disease. It drives out fear is what the Bible actually says. It drives out fear. And when it drives out fear, guess what else stays out? Sickness and disease. You have no fear of sickness, no fear of disease. You don't agree with it. You don't let it in. You live free and you just walk with God. Beloved, this is the everyday walk of a spirit-filled, spiritually-minded believer. It is not God's will. It is not his plan that believers, really anybody, but believers especially, would every day walk in sickness and pain and suffering and always this problem and that problem. No, he wants us to live in peace. Peace knowing that he is with us, he is for us, and he is in us. And so all this, now let's, let's keep moving forward here. <clears throat> but he says here, now watch this. Uh, in verse 16, above all, above all. Do you get that? Above all. Do you, do you, read, do you see that? Verse 16, not also it'd be good. No, he says above all. So he's already talking about the breastplate of righteousness, having your, goin, your, your goins, don't know what that is, having your loins girt about uh, with truth, having your feet, uh, you know, ha ha shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And here he says, but, uh, but above all that, taking the shield of faith. Now notice the shield of faith. Now we don't talk about this a lot, but notice th in this case, in our armor, our faith, all this armor is to protect us. Here, our faith is a shield. Now watch this. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So now get this, there should be no arrows, uh, fiery arrows, you know, f arrows lit on fire. Uh, should be, they, they should not be sticking in your breastplate. You get that? They should not be sticking in your breastplate. Why? Because you have a shield of faith and the shield of faith is what takes the fiery arrows. And whenever your shield of faith is up, now these fiery arrows from the enemy Hit your shield. Now notice, you may know it when, when your shield gets hit, but notice if it's hitting your shield, it's not hitting you. So it's not a matter of it hitting you and, oh, this is the, and I'm under attack and this and that. No, no, no. It's hitting your shield. Recognize it. Keep your shield of faith up. You may know when you're in a battle. You may know when things are happening, but keep your shield of faith up. Let your shield take the damage. Let your shield take the onslaught. You understand? And it won't touch you. Now, he says here, 
and verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. The helmet. Notice the helmet covers your head. It covers your brain. It covers your thought processes. And he says that what he's saying there is that you have to know that your salvation is assured, that you have to know that you know that you know that you're saved, that you're not guessing, you're not wondering, but you know that you are saved. And notice that it doesn't just say, take the helmet of being saved. It's the helmet of salvation. What is salvation? Salvation is a complete provision. It's provision uh, of health. It's provision of, of provision of actually what you need, the things you need. It is a provision of peace. It is all of these things are all part of salvation. So if you're, uh, go, you know, if, if you are, are going to go to heaven when you die, as they would say, uh, but you're sick now, let me tell you, you're not experiencing full salvation. You're only experiencing one part of it. To experience fullness of salvation, you need to move into divine health. You need to move into divine provision. You need to move into divine peace. Now, notice he said, and take the helmet of salvation, and watch, and this one, now watch this, and the sword of the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit. Now notice, this is the first offensive weapon we have, the first offensive piece of our armor. All this other armor is all defensive, but this is our only, only, I repeat, our only offensive weapon. Now, so what does that mean? That takes us automatically back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. So what is the weapon? See, so far we've seen the armor, but the weapon of our warfare, the only weapon mentioned here is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, here, as you probably know, there's two words, or not here, but in the, in the Bible. Actually, there's several words, but there are two main words used uh, in, the, in the Greek Testament, in the Greek manuscripts, uh, or the Greek text, for the word word. One is logos, one is rhema. Now, there's been a whole bunch of stuff taught on this, but if you will not just take somebody's word for it, if you will actually go in and study it, look up in your concord. I'll tell you how to do this. This is what I've done. I'll show you how to do it. You open your concordance or your, uh, you know, your device or whatever that has your Bible concordance on it, and you look up the word word, and the, especially in the, in the New Testament. Then you take that word word and everywhere it's written. Then you look at the numbers beside it, okay? Now, um, what is it? Uh, <clears throat> I was trying to remember exactly what they were trying to remember what the numbers were, but I know um, what the word logos, I think it's 3056 uh, in the King James. And then, so, um, but there's two different words and the word, one word is logos and the other is rhema. And so whenever you see these two words, why would they use two different words? And then people have said, well, rhema is a word of God right then that God gives you right then. Okay. That's technically not true. Okay. The word rhema is literally this. Rhema is the logos you act upon. So this written word, rightly divided in context, is the logos of God. Now the Bible tells us in James to be doers of the logos, doers of the word, not hearers only. And we're to be doers of the logos. So we're to be doers of this word. <clears throat> Notice we're not to be doers of a special word from God at a given time. Because if that's true, then if you don't get a word from God, then it's God's fault. And see, you're not going to stand before God and point your finger at him and go, well, you know, I really wanted to stand against the devil and take the, 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 the sword of the spirit, which is the rhema of God, because that's the word used here. But you didn't give me a rhema, so I just got to see even the concept of this is ridiculous. We have to be able to understand that the rhema is simply the logos you act upon. When you see logos, you read it and you go, OK, and, and now I understand about healing. Healing is God's will for me. Uh, it was provided for me. He says, by his stripes I was healed. Uh, and it, then he says in uh, 1 Peter 2, 24, by whose stripes you were healed. So if I was and I am, and if I were, then I am now. So I take his word. And so now I'm going to get up out of the sick bed and I'm going to act well. And I'm going to, because the Bible says I am well, and I believe that over what my body is telling me. And when you do that, that's a rhema. That is rhema. So see, you can make any, you personally can make any Logos become Rhema by simply acting upon it. Now, I know this, for many of you, this is revelation in itself. But beloved, I challenge you. Listen, don't, don't take my word for it. 
get your Bible out, get your concordance, go look up the words and do a study. Look up every word that, that is uh, translated as from Logos to Word. Look at every word translated from Rhema to Word and look at the difference. And every reference, every reference, you will see this, this point. Anytime the word Logos is used, it always goes back to the written in context uh, Bible, we would say. Every time the word rhema is used, it always has reference to uh, the, the word of God acted upon. There's always an action to be followed up on. Even when it says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, that word there is rhema. So <clears throat> listen, I don't know of anybody that's living by every word in this book. The word you live by is the word you act upon. If, if <clears throat> every law you obey, those are the laws you live by. If you're disobeying a law, you're not living by that law. So every rhema, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God that he acts upon. That's how you live. So anyway, that's <clears throat> I really wasn't intending to get into that today. But uh, now let's go on. But notice what he says here. And this is the key. He said, uh, <clears throat> and take the heaven of salvation, verse 17, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So now we know that our weapon, our only weapon is the word of God. And it's the word of God that we act upon. So now we have a word that we have to speak and we have to act upon it. We find it here and we speak it and we act upon it. Now watch. He says the next verse. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Now, now notice praying. What does praying entail? Usually praying entails speaking. So if we're going to pray with all manner of prayer, all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Now we're talking because the spirit, what is the spirit? He said, my words are life and they are spirit. Okay. Spirit and life. And so uh, we have to realize that when he's talking about this sword of the spirit that we take, that is to be done through prayer, pr predominantly in this context that praying with all prayer. We're to take the word of God and pray the word of God. We're to speak the word of God over this situation. And when we do that, we are using the rhema of God, the word of God uh, specific for that situation in that sense that we are acting upon. Now, <clears throat> let's, let's, because I want to show you how this works. If you will go with me to James, you know what? Now, I'm, I'm, I've been using the King James and I'll continue to use it. But right now I'm going to read from the uh, Weist New Testament. <clears throat> it is the expanded, an expanded translation by Kenneth S. Weist. It is the most accurate New Testament in existence today. It is amazing uh, if you look at it. Now, uh, we, have, um, <clears throat> we have some in our bookstore. If you would like to maybe go online and, and purchase them, you can. But um, it is an amazing Bible. It's what I always go back to when I'm investigating things. I always go back to this. Now, and in this translation, the Weist New Testament, in James chapter 5, and we're going to go to verse 17. Yeah. James chapter 5, verse 17. Now watch this. He says here, and I, you know what? I probably should go ahead and turn over there in my King James also, uh, just so that you have going back and forth here, <clears throat> just so you have it. So about that, James chapter 5. And the King James, it says, Elias, or Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now notice two things here. Number one, Elijah was a man subject to like passions that we are. In other words, he's saying, look, Elijah was just like us. He was a man just like us. And he prayed and it worked. He prayed no rain and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed again and it rained. He said, and he's a man just like us. Now we know also that it says that just above this in verse 13, the last part of verse 13 or 16, it says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then he talks about Elijah. So notice it is the effectual, the effective, the, the, the correct prayer. In other words, a prayer prayed correctly and prayed from a righteous man. 
it avails much. Now, you can, you can pray wrong and not get an answer. You can pray right and get an answer. And if you're a righteous person, a righteous man or woman, and you pray accurately, guess what will happen? You'll get results. Now, <clears throat> so let's look at this, all right? Here in the <clears throat> Louise translation, James chapter 5, verse 17. Elijah was a human being of like nature and constitution to us. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And it did not rain upon the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, here, uh, if you go back to verse the end of verse 16, it says, A prayer of a righteous person is able to do much as it operates. Now, think about that. Now, <clears throat> watch this. I want to take this next. So now, watch. We were talking about prayer being the sword of the Spirit. So our weapon is prayer. Our weapon is the words of our mouth. And honestly, every word that comes out of your mouth, you should be able to take those words and speak them to God as a prayer. Now, I'm not saying we walk around sounding like we're praying. I'm saying you should never speak in everyday um, conversation anything that you couldn't turn into a prayer to God. And if you would go by that rule and live by that rule, it's amazing how your language would change and how you would start seeing things happen every day in your life. Now, we're going to have to hurry here because <clears throat> I want to finish up on this. But uh, if you will go with me to get all my scriptures there. We're going to go real quick to 1 Kings. We're, we're talking about Elijah and we're talking about prayer. And that's what we're here for on these uh, right now during this time is to, is to come against uh, the situation that we have and the way we're going to beat it, number one, is through prayer because our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, to all these different things and casting down all these vain imaginations and all these things that exalt themselves against God. And we're going to do it by taking the armor of God and we're going to take the shield of faith and which will protect us. And we're going to take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God spoken out, acted upon and, and praying with all prayer and supplication. I'm just putting all these scriptures together. Now, in the First Kings chapter 17, First Kings chapter 17, it says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And get this, he just, now if you go back and look, you'll find in the verse, chapter 16, it says <clears throat> in verse 33, And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So now we see that Ahab was really bad, and we see that Elijah, out of a response to the thing that Ahab had done, comes up and says, from now, uh, from, from now, according to the words of my mouth, from now, there will be no rain until I say it will rain. Now, he's just showing up and just, just giving this uh, one, one, I think, commentary actually says this prediction or when this statement. And we have to realize he was saying this and God backed him up. Why? Because what we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. So we have to realize your words have power. That's why it's so important if you're listening to these broadcasts that you understand what's happening. Now, now go with me over to chapter 18. 18 verse 1. From 17 verse 1 to 18 verse 1. 1 Kings 18. And it came to pass after many days uh, that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, Go, show yourself unto Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. And that's what he did. Now, if you read this, if you go on, go with me to verse 41, uh, 1 Kings 18, 41. And here it says, <clears throat> uh, in verse 40, of course, Elijah took all the false prophets that were there and he took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. So he ended that problem that was going on. And in verse 41, it says, and Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. Now notice he had already said, 
go because there's a sound of abundance of rain. <clears throat> now he says, go look. And the, the, his servant went and looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again seven times. And he went back seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. <clears throat> now notice this. He had to pray seven times. Elijah was praying and praying and praying. And he kept saying, but notice he kept saying the same thing. He was saying the same thing over and over. He was commanding. He was speaking. Now, but that was a prayer in the sense that he was speaking the word of God. And then, and he kept praying. And finally, after the seventh time, the, his servant says, well, I, I see a little bit of cloud out there. And so he said, all right, all right, it, it, we're good. Go tell Ahab to get home as quick as he can. And then, of course, we know the next thing is that Ahab uh, took his, uh, it says it came to pass in the meantime, verse 45. Get over there. <clears throat> in the meanwhile, that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. And he girded up his loins, girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So he outran this, the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he outran a chariot, a king's chariot, who usually had the fastest horses. So that says something right there. But now notice, Elijah was a man like us. He prayed and it didn't rain. It didn't rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed again and it rained. At his word, it rained. Now, here's what I'm saying. Uh, <clears throat> it is up to us to pray and to say. And so we need to be praying and we need to be saying. And so today, right now, uh, we're going to say, and I want you to agree with me. Uh, we, I'm, I've given you the, the basis here. And we know that this coronavirus, the COVID-19, we know this thing. We know it's not of God. It's hurting people. It's killing people. It's shutting down economies. It's shutting down nations. This is not the will of God. And as a matter of fact, uh, matter of fact, I said, I think it was Monday, that, um, we, that my, my goal, what I was believing, was that um, this would be wrapped up by April 12th, which is, most people call it Easter. Uh, and so then I had not heard anything else about that. And then the next day, uh, I heard President Trump say that he was going to get things on, back online starting in, in, uh, on, on Easter. And so, now if you remember what we prayed, we prayed that President Trump would, and, and I know this has impacted many other nations, other people in other nations are listening, and you should be praying for your president, your kings, who, whoever's in authority over you. <clears throat> but listen, we prayed that President Trump would hear from God, would hear the voice of the Lord, and would obey it. That the people speaking into his ear would be righteous, and that they would be, have the word of God, and that he would begin to obey it. We spoke, we prayed as a group, uh, over a thousand people from what I understand were in this thing together. And we are commanding this thing to come to pass. We spoke this out for, for this time. And, we, and I firmly believe <clears throat> that God whispered that into his ear through either another, you know, obviously he didn't get it from his advisors because everybody's saying it can't happen. But you watch. And so now we're going to uh, pray right now. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We believe your word. And because of that, we speak. And we say in the name of Jesus, this coronavirus, this COVID-19 and every other <clears throat> weapon that is formed against us will not prosper. Every other weapon, all this, the economic shutdown, all of that, it ceases. That in the name of Jesus, this economy will rebound and come back stronger than ever before. This sickness, this disease, these things that are attacking people, it ceases. That in the name of Jesus, right now, we command life and health and wholeness. Now, right now, we say it will be this way and no other. We do not allow this to continue on. And Father, we thank you that what we declare and decree here on earth, what we forbid on earth is forbidden in heaven and by heaven. Now, in the name of Jesus right now, and I hold in my hand many, many uh, prayer requests that have come in, and we are taking these and praying over them, and we've already received many uh, testimonies from people that are being healed and that have already been healed from the prayers that we've already given and from what we've said. And so I'm going to uh, continue, keep sending in your prayer requests. I'm going to start reading some of these out at different times and praying over them, but I'm going to do it even off the air. 
uh, because we don't want to take up just time. Now, we will be saying these over the air at times. Probably tomorrow we'll take probably the whole session and just pray over all of these. But remember, if, you're, if you want us to pray for you, it's very simple. All you have to do, our prayer, our emergency prayer line is this. Get ready to write it down. The, the emergency prayer line is 469-343-8995. And you say, wait, wait, Curry, that's not the number you gave us yesterday. I know. It's because we've, we're trying to, to uh, now we have a dedicated phone number just for this. All right. Uh, the other phone number had other things coming in and we're trying to specialize this so that we can get to all of these prayer requests. So again, 469-343-8995. So if you have an emergency prayer, now emergency means somebody's going to die within 24 hours unless something changes. So that's the emergency prayer line. That's not the everyday prayer line. That's not the prayer line. You know, honestly, even with the COVID-19, that kind of stuff, that technically wouldn't be emergency prayer. I know it may, you may feel like it, but it's only if uh, they have told you you're going to die within the next 24 hours. Now, other prayer requests, other ways to get a hold of us. There is another way. You can go to dhttraining, dhttraining.com slash healing. Now, if you have a prayer request, if you go to that dhttraining.com slash healing, that will take you directly to a prayer request form. And if you will fill it all out and then email it to us, we will get it. And that's what I'm actually looking at right here. These are those forms that have already come in. And so uh, you can get to us directly uh, through that means and we will uh, get your prayer requests. Now, you can uh, also, now understand when you write to us, be sure to tell us where you are, city, state, country, give us your name, give us the, the problem that you want us to pray about, and then give us your phone number, preferably. And what we're going to do is we're going to take these, we're, we're praying for them, but we also have people around the world that we can forward these to, that they can reach out and touch and uh, contact you, get in touch with you directly. And so this is vitally important. Now, the office number here, that's the office here at headquarters, that's 469-209-0946. Four six nine, two zero nine, zero nine four six, 0946 And you can call directly and give the information there. But if it's in a prayer request, we would appreciate it if you would call, or I'm sorry, if you would email us by the dhttraining.com backslash or slash healing. Uh, and that, that'll get you to the form that you need. Now, uh, we probably need to finish for the day, <clears throat> but uh, I, I will, you know what I'm going to read uh, one of these here, um, there was one I saw. Yeah, this one is from Jonathan in the United Arab Emirates, uh, actually in Dubai. It says, I need healing for the following. Uh, there's a heart, heart situation, hypertension, uh, cholesterol, and type 2 diabetes, hyperthyroidism. Uh, and now, now there's also the issue of a fatty liver due to the large amount of medication. And so right now, right now, now we're going to, I'm also demonstrating, please listen, when I pray for Jonathan, you can listen to what I'm praying. Don't try to, you know, make it into some type of incantation or a formula, but understand how I'm praying. and It'll teach you how to pray uh, even while I'm praying for Jonathan. So right now, in the name of Jesus, right now, Father, we thank you. Your word is so true. We rely upon it. We stand upon it. We believe your word. So in the name of Jesus, now notice right now I'm shifting. I was just talking to the Father, now I'm shifting. I'm not talking to the Father about this. He didn't say, speak to the Father about the mountain. He said, speak to the mountain. So now we're going to speak to these mountains here in Jonathan's life. So I say, Jonathan, in Jesus' name, right now, be healed head to toe. Be healed now. Heart, function correctly in Jesus' name. Be healed now hypothyroidism, I command you, go in Jesus' name, right now, right now. Hypertension, go. We command the blood pressure system to regulate and to return to normal in the name of Jesus. Diabetes, you will go. Every bit of this will leave him now. Jonathan, be healed right now. Now, the fatty liver, that's going to return to normal because now you're going to be healed 
and you watch as you're healed, then you won't need the medicine and things, and that then the fatty liver will automatically go back in reverse. But we're adding faith and life to this command. And when we do, that means your fatty liver will heal faster and be restored faster. So in the name of Jesus, Jonathan, be healed now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, it's just that simple. Now, and there are many more uh, that we will be going through, uh, and I'm, I'm going to read them, pray over them, and then tomorrow we'll probably come back out and even bring some of these out for them because there are some very serious things here, and we're going to hit all of them. So, anyway, uh, so we're going to let you go for today. We appreciate you tuning in. I went over a little, well, actually not too much longer. We, we did about right because uh, we started late. I apologize for that. Um, you know, the enemy... We're getting results. We're getting tremendous results. And uh, because of that, uh, the enemy tries to slow us down, tries to stop it, but he can't. He is defeated. And so in every way that we find, we will put him under our feet. So or, or again, remember, it's up to us at this time. Rise up. Rise up and be the body of Christ. Rise up and be sons and daughters of the Most High. Rise up and manifest as sons and daughters of God. And you do that by living the word and speaking the word and agreeing with God in Jesus' name. So till tomorrow, God bless you. We love you. Be sure to call us, email us, whatever you need. We're here for you and we will be. So God bless you. See you again soon.